This episode may contain sensitive language not suitable for children. Hello again, through Black Lives and Children audience. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn. In this episode, Dr. Marvin Dunn, our program expert, promised you that if any significant progress was made in the Aubrey case, well, progress was made, and Dr. Dunn is here to give you an update. Dr. Dunn, thank you very much for returning to this addendum. Sure, glad to be here. In your earlier classification of this case, you classified it as a murder. Now that a third person has been arrested, Roddy Bryan, does this change the classification, and if so, why and how? Oh, yes, it does change it. There was a meeting at the Ski Institute back in the 1930s, I believe, where several organizations came together to agree on what defined a lynching as uh, distinct from a common murder. And they came up with a number of criteria, four things had to apply for a killing to be defined as a lynching. One was that there had to be a dead body. Okay as opposed to someone that maimed and not really killed. Uh, The killing had to take place uh, outside of the law, Mm extra-legally. Third, uh, the motive had to be race, revenge, or or, or honor. And then the fourth criteria was that the killing must have been carried out by three or more people. And initially, uh, in this case, there were two people charged with this killing. Therefore, it was not a, a lynching. But now there's a third person arrested and charged in this crime, and that makes it a lynching. And that's Roger Bryan. Correct. So, that, you know, every time we cry lynching, uh, it's not necessarily, in fact, a lynching. So we need to have a way of, when a black person, anybody gets killed, mm-hmm. uh, whether or not that particular act rises to the level of being considered a lynching. In this instance, mm-hmm. it does. Let me ask you something else about this case, because I'm trying to get you, uh, of course, to update the audience as to where we are today with this case. Uh, We didn't know anything about releasing any additional tapes showing Ahmaud Arbery uh, having some problems with the police. Why are they releasing video now? They're doing it to assassinate his character. In many of these cases where a black man has been uh, killed by white people, uh, there is an attempt to make the black person into a criminal. It happened to Trayvon Martin and many other instances that we can name. What happens is that they will go back and dig up any kind of irrelevant instances in the person's life in which uh, it does not reflect well upon them. So these one or two encounters that were brought forth uh, were intended to have people who chose to do so believe that this man was a criminal, that he was a threat, and that he needed to be taken into custody. So it's a very common reaction when this happens. Make the victim into a criminal, and therefore the persons who did it have some sort of an excuse for having done what they did. Exactly. And we, of course, have seen time and time again uh, video from the family and testimony from the family and friends speaking to what an outstanding young man Mark Aubrey was. Yeah, and just because he had a problem with the police stopping him, uh, he, he had a right to challenge uh, what they were stopping him for. He, a, he had a right to tell them that they could not search his car. We all have that right. So I don't know that that information had any kind of influence on the actual case. And of course, I'm no lawyer, but I think that an undercover police officer attempting to stop someone by making an arrest that he identifies himself as a police officer, I didn't see anything in the tape where this Michael guy made any identification. He just started doing whatever he did. But let's get that part. Now, it is alleged that the property owner engaged Mr. Mike Michael, a former police officer, to keep an eye on his property. So does this justify Mr. Mike Michael's action? No, 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 no. He was not deputized officially by any law enforcement entity to act on behalf of law enforcement. Uh, Any kind of a casual conversation between him and the property owner or even him and the police. I didn't think so. You know, uh, I've been told that former President Barack Obama has publicly responded. uh, Have you heard anything from President Trump? 
Well, I think the president said that the first time that the matter was mentioned to him, uh, President Trump said he hadn't seen the tape. The rest yeah. of the planet had seen the tape, but Trump hadn't seen it. I think the next day uh, he said that it was disturbing or something of that sort. And that was the extent of the president's comments about what happened. President Obama, on the other hand, just a few days ago, I think during the course of uh, his delivering commencement, uh, one of the commencement addresses, uh, mm-hmm. was very specific in expressing right. empathy, mm-hmm. uh, in, in expressing uh, questions about whether or not they had, uh, these white men had a right to stop this man. Uh, Obama did the right thing by saying, or rather by asking, mm-hmm. the important questions that are still hanging over this case. Uh, Trump issued a statement that was mealy mouth and had no real impact. What we needed, what the country needed, what black Americans needed, was for the president of the United States to stand up and say, this appears to be wrong, and the federal government will make sure that no civil rights in this instance was violated. And then let the legal uh, course proceed as it should. Uh, let's cut through the case here. Is there a national anti lynching law? We know that at least three assistant district attorneys, I believe they are, have recused themselves from this case. We've heard that the governor will handle it. Let's go to the national level. What can be done at the national level? Are there any laws there? No. This past February 2020, the Senate and the House passed Mm -hmm. an anti-lynching law the first time since 1918. And that law has not been signed by the president. So we have a bipartisan law yes. passed by the House and the Senate Correct. sitting on the president's desk. Correct. And had that law been signed uh, prior to this killing, then the federal government would have been uh, a, a, a properly pressed into service to take over this case. Mm-hmm. Uh, absent a federal law, it stays in the hands of the Georgia Department of Law Enforcement. It's incredible that it's taken a century just to get an anti-lynching law this far, just to the president's death. I doubt that Trump will sign it. Uh, and even if he does, uh, it's too late for this victim. It's too late for others. From your experience, where do we go from here? Uh, we elect the president who will sign the anti-lynching law that's sitting on President Trump's death. That that's basically it. That's the end all, if we want federal intervention in lynching. Now, I would say that every time a black person gets killed by a white person, we shouldn't all just jump up and say lynching. Because when a real lynching takes place, like this case, then the public is jaded to it. Uh, the mm-hmm. black folks say every, every time a black person gets killed, it's a lynching, it's a lynching, it's a lynching. This was, by every definition, every historic definition, a lynching. Okay, Dr. Marvin Dunn, I want to thank you for adding this addendum to the original taping of this episode and reassure our audience that Through Black Eyes and Children will continue to follow this case and will keep them informed. I'm Dr. Raymond Dunn. I thank you for listening and invite you to follow Through Black Eyes and Children as we present our topic, Unfiltered, as seen through Black Eyes.